Hello, I'm Roger Sutton, Editor Emeritus of The Hornbook. And I'm here today with Alyssa Gershowitz, who is the Executive Editor and Acting Editor-in-Chief of The Hornbook, and Liza Baker, who is Vice President and Publisher of Zero to Eight Publishing at Scholastic. And so it was picture books from the beginning for you? Picture books from the beginning, yes. Um, and that, that was really what I loved the most. Um, I, I loved art and loved studying art history in addition to English in school, and so I knew that was going to be my path, or that was the path I hoped. I started my career um, at HarperCollins um, in 1993, and um, working on picture books from the very outset, um, I worked with Aliki Brandenburg, who um, published a, a seminal book called How a Book is Made, and that, used, oh, that yeah. book used to be left on everyone's desk entering <laughs> publishing. So that was an incredible time and a, an incredible place um, for me to begin my career with a backlist of talent unlike really many other houses. I mean, it was a great training, training ground for me. I worked with Ashley Bryan. Um, w which was amazing. I worked with Walter Dean Ma Myers um, on a beautiful photographic book called Brown Angels. Brown Angels. Yes. Yeah. So um, those were my early days. Then I came to Scholastic and I worked under Burnett Ford um, and Jean Fywell um, working on picture books and on novelty books and that's when I first fell in love with board books and lift mm -hmm. the flap books and that category of publishing that is highly creative and, and very inspirational to me, and, and there's a really nice overlap with picture books. Um, and then I went to Little Brown, um, where I worked as editor-in-chief of their picture book list for 10 years um, with Patty Ann Harris, who was our creative director. We've, mm, we've kind of traveled together. <laughs> <laughs> we've traveled together. We've worked together 20 years. So, And now I've been back at Scholastic for nine years. Um, growing our picture book list, um, and I'm, I'm really proud of the books. Particular, I mean, I've always been proud of the books I've worked on um, and, and celebrated and championed, but it's a particularly exciting time for the list. Mm -hmm. So much seems to be crystallizing, and we have an incredible list of uh, editorial talent on our, on our team that um, I think that the results speak for themselves here. Mm -hmm. It's, I mean, a time where we really <coughs> celebrate diverse voices, diverse points of view, and it, it certainly is an eclectic mix. And again, our objective at Scholastic, we are so kid-focused. We're always thinking about the child reader. Um, every child is so different. Um, there's not a one-size-fits-all, so we want to reach as many children as possible. Um, with our list. Mm -hmm. It really, I mean, having that variety and acknowledging the differences among readers um, and giving, you know, children choice and agency, your favorite word, yeah. <laughs> um, to I be able to... never let academic <laughs> jargon in the horn book. But now she's in True. charge, so maybe things will change. <laughs> but to be able to explore interests and, you know, a kid might pick up one of these books and say, well, this isn't for me, but this is for me. Um, so just acknowledging that as, as readers being, you know, young people from zero to eight, um, you know, being people <laughs> is, is really helpful. Well, today we're going to focus <laughs> upon five new picture books mm -hmm. that you are publishing. Yes. You edited yourself, edited two of them, and yes. then there were three others within this group. Um, and I hope we get a chance to look at each one in some detail, and you can tell us about them. But first... <laughs> um, so when the box of books arrived, it was the biggest thrill of the week because getting actual books was just so wonderful and being able to open the box and see all of the books. So we opened the box, we read the books one by one, enjoyed the books one by one, and we got to the end and thought, huh, in preparation for this talk, what do we what do we have in common? What can we see about these books together? Um, what do you see as common elements of the books, um, or what drew you to them in the in the first place? There are many overarching themes, I would mm -hmm. say, in each of these books. Um, but the one word that kind of came to me um, in the middle of the night is bravery. Mm. And each of these books, um, in their own unique way, 
tells a very brave, um, brave story to change a planet. So many of us avoid the topic of global warming um, with our children. But Christina bravely, in 150 words, um, with this incredible illustrator, Rahele Jamapur Bell, tackles this topic with such bravery and intensity, but such joy and warmth and optimism. You know, I, I am just so moved by the bravery she shows and also the bravery that she's instilling in our young readers mm -hmm. to, to be brave and bold enough to, to change a planet. Just like Jesse Owens, our other picture book um, by Ambassador Andrew Young and his daughter, uh, Paula Young Shelton. I'm sure you read this. I, I mean, the themes within this book, um, Hitler, Nazism, um, racism, um, and, and what this child is able to overcome um, is incredible. <laughs> Not to mention Jesse Owens and the bravery he showed mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, in Germany, winning four gold medals. I mean, incredible, the moment when they're in the orchestra watching this film, it, it gives me goosebumps. And I, I just have to say Gordon C. James, too, um, did such an incredible mm -hmm. job, and I can't wait yeah. to talk a little bit more about that. Um, an unlikely topic of bravery, mm -hmm. but the three billy goats gruff. Mm -hmm. I mean, this tackles themes of, you know, challenging your bully. Who is threatening you? And also, who's the good guy and who's the bad guy? There's great twists here. I know you're a fan, um, Roger, of this story. Thank God for big brothers. Right? <laughs> <laughs> big, big brothers. Yes. <laughs> so, so bravery here. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, I think Mac really tackled Mac and John together. Um, he didn't shy away um, from the kind of grim details. Um, my own kids are a little fearful of this story in some in some ways. <laughs> it's it's. It's a little chilling and haunting, and the visual narrative um, really has you on the edge of your seat. But there is, of course, a great payoff. <laughs> and the Tower of Life, this incredible story of bravery. A young little uh, girl growing up in Poland, when, when the Nazis came rolling into her town, into her shtetl, and took over and literally stole the lives of 3,500 people in a community who had been there I mean, for hundreds and hundreds of years, they were eliminated. And she, her mom was uh, a photographer. And before they left, I mean, in, in breakneck time, she stole mm -hmm. the, the photographs, tucked them into her sock, and escaped into, into the woods and hid at a local um, farm's home where um, her mom literally taught her on the wall drawing on the wall, That's, they, that this was their classroom. So um, to me, themes of bravery resonate here. I am Ruby Bridges, um, a six-year-old child who walked into her school as a, a six-year-old little girl and unbeknownst to her was desegregating mm -hmm. um, our school system um, and challenging um, those norms. Um, incredibly brave. I just have to tell the the journey of how um, we came to find Nicholas Smith, um, Patty Ann Harris, our creative director, and I were looking for the perfect artist to bring Ruby's story to life anew. And um, interestingly, this artist, um, artivist, he calls himself an artivist because he is an activist, posted this image of Ruby Bridges on Instagram. Oh. Mm -hmm. Inspired by the Norman Rockwell rendering of young Ruby. So we took it as a sign and we reached out to Nicholas. And when I say we fell in love with Nicholas, the moment we chatted with him, um, I, I, I am speaking absolute truth. Nicholas was, we had a virtual call um, and his new baby was in the call coming in and out because um, of course he's illustrating from home. Um, Nicholas has an incredible, he has a TED talk incredibly inspiring human being and artist and um, 
you know, worked for Disney for many years, the painter and published author in his own right. But when we came to him with this Ruby Bridges story, he said, I have to do this book. He said, I grew up with the Norman Rockwell painting in my home. I'm a black boy from Texas. I, I feel such a kindred spirit with Ruby um, Bridges. And we went on to have a kind of kickoff call, as we often do, um, with the author and artist. So um, we brought Ruby and Nicholas together. Um, and just watched a real uh, friendship um, come to life, um, creatively, artistically, but also just um, the overlap in um, their experience and in their lives. Um, so, so Nicholas signed on um, immediately. Um, and this was before he became a number one New York Times bestseller. <laughs> his, really, his career um, was beginning to skyrocket. Um, so, Nicholas, I asked him to share some of the um, inspiration behind his visual narrative. Um, so he shared some of these old photos um, that he, his mom had shared with him to use as research. Ruby and Nicholas bonded very much over their loving relationship with their grandmother. Um, in the story, we find out that Ruby, Ruby's name was chosen by her, her grandmother. So, um, but they had a lot of fun really bonding over their special relationships with their grandmother and um, even down to the detail of the wallpaper inspired um, by a Louisiana pattern. Um, Nicholas has family in Louisiana, which is where Ruby um, lives um, now. So um, you can just see also here, we had a lot of conversation. Ruby felt very um, strongly about defining what opportunity meant in a visual narrative. So it began here where, you know, you could see Ruby getting her gold stars. Um, and then this is the Ruby, um, of course, playing on the metaphor of Ruby's name. This is the journey of her name. And what that means, what does opportunity mean? She really wanted to show readers um, what opportunity looked like. So they understood it might be a word unfamiliar to young picture book readers. Um, but this is an image um, I really wanted to share with you all today. You know, Ruby described when she first arrived at the school, escorted by U.S. Marshals, she still did not know why she was there. Her parents never told her. Wow. So on that morning, as she's walking through the crowds, she literally thought, this must be Mardi Gras. I know mm. that because all of the cheering people to her, um, in her mind, she didn't quite see uh, the anger and rage of these crowds that were there to protest her very presence, um, which she, she wondered, where are the beads? Where are the Mar Mardi Gras beads? But this um, image is the one I wanted to show you, Nicholas's sketch here. Um, this is the principal of the school, and originally in the sketch, she's rendered holding her hand out to little Ruby. And, and look at the, R Ruby's little hand. Mm. And we talked about this with Ruby and Nicholas, and we were talking about that moment. And Ruby said, you know, she didn't actually extend her hand to me. She wouldn't. That's when Ruby knew for the very first time that she was not wanted in the school by many. Um, that was not, of course, her experience with her teacher. Another ingredient I really wanted to point out is the very child-centric view of all of these stories. and the respect and reverence um, that each author um, and illustrator really showed to the child reader. Um, um, for Maya and Ruby Bridges, that, that child's eye view that was so important to Ruby to capture in this telling. Of course, many of us know the story of Ruby Bridges, but it's never been told before quite like this. And she really did stay. She is 100% authentic as, as a human being, as a um, activist as a creator, um, but she she was very clear um, about the voice she wanted to capture in her writing, and um, I think she really did accomplish that. And particularly with nonfiction, particularly with some of these harder topics um, from the Tower of Life. I mean, this is a joyful story. It's one I've handed to so many people internally. The Bound Books just came in. Um, I gave it to our president, Ellie Berger, and she, of course, read it at Acquisitions, but I said, this is a book that you need to read and experience. Um, the editor, Diane Hess, and I were speaking um, just this past week, 
it is biography in a way that, um, I mean, it tackles these really horrific events. People were murdered. But the spirit of this telling, it is joyful. The palette of this telling is joyful. The bright yellow, um, her blue gingham dress. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are very intentional choices within this visual story. There is a, a thread of optimism. But I, I do feel like it's a time in books, in picture books in particular, where we're going there. Maybe where we didn't before, or maybe um, we're doing so in a perhaps bolder way, um, perhaps necessitated by where we are in the world and, and what the kids need and what children are exposed to. So these conversations are happening. And earlier you had said about the Ruby Bridges book, Unbeknownst to Her, and that I've never seen the story told from that perspective before. Of She's just a child. She's in school. She's looking around in the hallways. She's the only one there. And she thinks, well, where are my classmates? We know, of course, and you know, kids know. Um, but to really see things from her perspective at the same time as readers have that sort of historical hindsight, um, it's just a really different way of approaching the story. But I think, too, that going back to the Tower of Life, uh, in the book, after the war, she goes back to her town, and the text says something like, but she realized she couldn't stay there. But in the notes at the end, we find out that her mother and brother, right, were killed when they went back to the town. Yes. So that was a very good reason for her to leave. Yeah. But I thought it was interesting that you don't have that in the main story, but you do include it in the appended information. Mm -hmm. I think that's a key point, Roger, because um, there is content that can live within the actual storytelling, within the read aloud, you know, imagining a library or a parent at home. And then there is the back matter where you can dig a little bit more deeply and reach an older reader or a child who has questions that a parent feels that they are, or a caregiver is, is ready to share. Mm -hmm. um, we have to get to the truth but it's how do we tell that story. It's all about the choice of uh, the voice and, and again, um, centering the child, remembering yeah. what they're able to absorb um, and meeting them where they are, I think. It sort of also refreshingly sidesteps the sort of trauma porn narrative that come along with some of these underrepresented stories that, you know, the Holocaust story, uh, the horrors of the Holocaust, we don't want that to be forgotten, certainly, but we also don't want that victim story to be the story, the one and only story. Yes. Um, so having the, the main narrative be one level and then having the back matter introduce um, you know, some of these harsher realities so that you don't lose that because you don't want these stories to all be you know, cheerful. In the end, we all <laughs> survived and did fine um, because that's not true. It's not the truth. Um, but in a picture book, to be able to really balance those pieces, it's, it's difficult. And when it's done well, it really comes through. It's so true. I think it's one of the most difficult things you can do. And, and many books don't succeed mm -hmm. at it. And I'm so glad you're holding Just Like Jesse Owens. I want to point out Gordon James is such an incredible gift mm. to us, to Beautiful. the publishing world, to the picture book world. He repainted that cover. Um, we decided when we saw it how exciting it would be to have it be a full wrap cover. So you'll see the story oh. continues thing on the back. Another you can't do with a PDF. <laughs> yes. I know. Thank you, Roger. <laughs> yeah. um, just so mm -hmm. breathtaking. Mm -hmm. um, and I want to also point out he painted this entire book um, on the set of pastels that were gifted to him mm -hmm. by his parents mm -hmm. um, when he first graduated and entered the art world um, and he had saved them for this moment and he knew um, when Ambassador Andrew Young um, approached him with this story, when Andre Davis Pinckney approached him with this story, he knew the time was right to break open those pastels mm -hmm. and I mean, just staggering mm -hmm. illustrations on every page mm -hmm. um, and I do have some sketches to share. His sketches are more beautiful and his finishes in oh. some ways, and you'll see on the end papers, we decided to keep them black and white sketches. Wow. He did, you know, had many conversations with Ambassador Young, did extensive research, 
you'll see just the, the tooth and detail of these beautiful black and white sketches. Mm -hmm. They're so dynamic. Well, and this is such an interesting array of talent, people who have, are known for other genres, people who um, are known for other characters, um, people whose personalities we know, but maybe we don't know them on the page. Um, so that was another really interesting piece, opening the box and, and reading through one by one, is who these these authors are and what stories they're telling. And um, sometimes they're stories you could sort of predict, and sometimes they're totally unexpected. And um, this is really exciting to, to see this array and, and see who we have in yeah. front of us. Well, thank you for making that observation. Yes, I, I mean, Christina is, of course, widely published and revered and acclaimed. Um, this is her first picture book. And again, as I mentioned before, the fact that it's 150 words is mm -hmm. truly incredible. And um, Tracy Mack, the editor of this book, really um, wanted me to to share, you know, her fear. She fell in love with this instantly and called the agent like within 20 minutes of receiving this manuscript and said, I have to publish this book. What I loved learning, uh, Rahele shared um, these beautiful um, early um, thumbnail color um, sketches from a book dummy that she created um, that literally took my breath away. But Tracy, um, Tracy and Marika, who is the art director for this book, sent a list of 35 to 40 adjectives, words that they mm. wanted Rahele to, to kind of um, internalize and keep, focus on. Um, because I think the greatest fear was that this would be a frightening book and one that would be dire and, uh, you know, doomsday. But really, um, we wanted this, and I, I love, the, I mean, it's just so powerful, this idea that the power of one, um, that's what you come away from this story. Yes, you are one, but one person plus another person plus another person can, can change the planet can change the world. We wanted to show the beauty um, of the earth and really for, for children to save the earth, they have to fall in love with the earth. And that was really the goal, and I think you do. Um, Rahele chose a very bright palette. Um, again, not to sugarcoat what's happening because there are very real m raw moments. Um, frightening moments within this story. Tracy took care to ensure that every single word sang um, and was meaningful and intentional. Um, so it all begins there. And, and then Rahele, interestingly enough, was um, a We Need Diverse Books. Um, she was honored um, by we, we Need Diverse Books and also apprenticed under Patty Ann Harris, who is our creative director. She was a uh, mentee. So it's just interesting, these different paths and the way they intersect. I will tell you that when I was reading um, this book to my, my, my cynical nine-year-old, he <laughs> thought he knew, well, you know, climate change, the world is bad, but the way that she really communicates that, the, yes, the world is bad, we're not going to sugarcoat that, but the one you know the one step and then more join and you do what you can and so it, it was just in real time it was funny to be able to to see the child my child respond to to the book in that way thinking that he knew um you know what was what <laughs> that he had the answers <laughs> but, right yeah. if only I how do you both find because you both have children and how do you find having children affects your work in children's books it keeps you honest, I would say, <laughs> right? The books that I had on my shelf and loved and was so proud of, sort of pre-child, some of those my kids <laughs> <laughs> throw out the window and say, I, Mommy, I don't, I, don't, I don't like that book. Mm -hmm. um, they're very honest. Um, but Alyssa, what about you? You know, if you're reading a book aloud to a child, um, it's different from reading a book in your own head, especially when it comes to a picture book, but when it comes to a chapter book or, um, you know, that, that together time, it, it makes a difference. Now, again, you should not impose that on everyone else. I, my child loves this right. book and that's, that's the book. Um, but it does, you know, it's useful to have little test subjects running around who can respond um, 
you know, in real time to, to something you're doing. You know, we work at Scholastic. We, in addition to selling to all the standard trade accounts, all of the independent booksellers, Barnes & Noble, um, the Mass Channels, we also distribute our books into book clubs and book fairs, of course, so we know firsthand and have to always think about what are the books that the child will pick themselves mm -hmm. in the book flyers or when they're at the book fairs in their schools, of course the most thrilling week of the year, um, what, what are they gravitating to and what are they choosing? It keeps us very honest mm -hmm. in some ways and again we have to filter it through. There are many different needs um, that we're trying to fulfill. But another thing too, not just centering the child, but like the experience of a picture book is an all-age experience. It is often shared. Um, most times it is mm -hmm. heart to heart or you know with a child on your lap. I do look at it first through a child's lens but but it is an all-ages experience and I try and keep um, readers reading picture books um, you know as long as we can because what a gift it is to read a visual narrative and read a story um, into your older lives as well, right? That's why we're all here. There are lots of stories, and we are going to take a break here, and then when we come back, Liza is going to take us through the journey of how one book on this list made it from submission to publication. Mm -hmm. 